one on YouTube. Let's uh, get that my favorite feature autofocus turned off. So what are we working on today? Well, before we get started, oh baby, my baby. My baby was stolen from me once again by dipshit contractor. Uh, and you know, he He's trying to like put it off on his worker. He's always trying to like blame somebody else. He can never accept responsibility. He's like, oh, well, they gave it to me and I didn't know whose it was. Well, if they gave it to you and you accepted it, you're 50 50 responsible for it, dumbass. So, anyways. Um, so, yeah, he had it in the back of his truck and I was. Uh, it's like losing my mind trying to figure out where on earth. Where on earth I put this thing? You know, I've lost things before. I try not to lose things, but um, you, you know, as of late, I have been somewhat decent about not losing stuff. So the fact that I had lost this was really driving me crazy. Maybe this time, next time, he'll uh, think twice about pocketing a hammer. You know, he knows I'm a handyman, so it's like, how did you not think to ask the tenant? Because the hammer was leaning against the door, holding the door open. And I saw the construction worker double take on it. Sticky fingers, I tell you. Sticky damn fingers. So just real quick, I'll show you how the uh, repair came out. I guess I gotta put the autofocus back on. Or reset it. So this was the piece that I epoxied in. Kind of sanded it. Came out pretty nice. It's just kind of a couple low spots here. I'm not too worried about that, but... I just wanted to get this uh, knot all glued in there. The finger slicer. All right, so we are going to be putting a coat of our favorite primer on this today, our Kills 2 Latex Primer, multi-surface stain blocker, bloqueador de manchas para superficies multiples. For all surfaces, superficies. Superficies. I guess that's surfaces. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So all you have to do is read the label in, uh, in California. You're going to learn some Spanish. <laughs> all right, look at that. Beautiful white. Gorgeous, gorgeous white. Now, I actually do have some plastic cups. I could pour it out into it, but... Uh, you know, if you're going to do a long painting project, longer than, like... Um, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I guess you could pour it into the cup, but I like the tin for a couple of reasons. One, it's easier. It's kind of helps you get a nice, even amount of paint. Sometimes when the paint gets low in the cup and you can't always get an even amount, um, you know, it is a little warm today. Maybe I should use a cup because you don't really want the paint to be drying out too much while you're using it. I, I paint out of the can pretty often, but I mean, I guess it was only a dollar for 23 cups, so it's, you know, just under, uh, what is it like, under four cents, just a little over four cents a cup. You know, you know me and my budgeting, try to save four cents every way I can. Anyways. Oh, why are there two pieces of fuzz on that? All right, so I wish, you know, they have little pore spots for these and I keep, I wouldn't say I keep meaning to get one. I keep meaning to meaning to get one, but <laughs> besides the point. So let's, how much paint are we gonna need? Hmm, mm hmm, hmm. We are gonna need about, I'm gonna say half a cup. I can always pour it back in, but let's say half a cup, give or take. Alright, and then just to kind of clean this off, we'll take our brush and come right through here. Waste not, want not. And this little this little can of primer, I don't know if this is the first can or second kind of primer that I bought, but uh, this lasted a long time. I almost bought a gallon, but I figured, eh, I don't want a gallon of paint, I better have fresh paint, right? So I'm kind of surprised how long it has lasted. 
Oh, I'm so glad I have the hammer. You know, a handyman without a hammer is like a prepper without a bug out bag. I don't know where else going with that analogy, but yeah. Any anybody worth their weight, anything who does work construction work needs to have a hammer among several other dozen tools. In fact, when people I finally figured out a good way to explain people why I don't do a lot of plumbing and electricity. I used to just say, oh, well, you know, I just don't do a lot of it. And that I don't think people were really satisfied with that answer. So my new answer is that if I wanted to be an electrician or a plumber, I would have to have several thousand dollars worth of tools. And it's just, you know, and as soon as I say that, they're like, oh, okay, I kind of get it, you know. And I always tell the homeowner, look, if you, you know, it's better for you if you have a plumbing issue to get a plumber, it's better if you have an electrician issue or electric issue to get an electrician. Not just for the quality of the work, but um, liability wise. Uh, in California, uh, it's not really advisable from a legal point of view to be doing um, electrician, uh, electrical work if you're not a licensed contractor or uh, plumbing work if you're not a licensed plumber. Of course, there's no such thing as a licensed IKEA a furniture assembler, thank heavens. But anyways, I uh, did a couple, just a little bit of quick sanding on this guy with a little block of wood and some uh, 100. This is 150, but I was using that for the hammer. Little blocks like this, best sanding implements. The reason that it's a lot better to use a block than just your hand is because if you use your hand, you're going to get kind of uneven pressure, but by using a block, you keep a nice even surface, so it gives you a lot flatter, a lot flatter sand. The more you know, so you notice I'm kind of laying the paint on thick in the middle and then sort of coming over it. Oh man, these corners are going to corners are going to give me grief. So I'm trying to get this uh, seat post together so that I'm strongly considering doing a test setup in the front lawn so I can get an updated picture of, uh, of the entire contraption. Because my most recent picture involves the old pontoons, which were failures, so I kind of want to get a picture of the new pontoon set up for the for this potential employer but also for um, you know for the blog for other employers just because I haven't really blogged a lot on the windsurf Moran website recently and kind of busy with school and such school applications related things in fact these days it almost feels like you know, I sort of wake up and I kind of start off slow and I'm not always, you know, in a mood to start attacking my homework per se, but, um, man, recently I've just been busy, you know, emails and emails and phone calls and letters and packages and life is getting a little bit busier, which is okay. I've been, my life has been sort of boring the last few years for the most part. Yeah, you know, part of that's my fault. I could be, I could go out of my way a little bit more to have an interesting life, but interesting life just kind of costs money sometimes. It's, it's really hard to kind of get out of the house and not, you know, spend more than five or ten bucks or something. I mean, you can do it. You know, I guess I could just go on hikes all the time, but it's, uh, it's kind of a challenging thing between gas and meals and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So speaking of emails, I got an email, I actually got a phone call from, uh, speaking of communication, I should say, I got a phone call from, uh, what was the name of the company? Um, something Right. Anyways, one of the companies that was listed as a partner on this scammy website, and guess what he said? No. He said, well, first of all, he said we're a global company, so I did a little bit of research and I looked into it, and he said we've never worked with Essex Leasing, we haven't heard of them. He even went so far as to tell me that the website was based out of Poland and Ukraine, 
which definitely matches the accent. In fact, I would place the accent as Polish um, because I used to have a Ukrainian girlfriend years ago, so I can kind of recognize to a certain extent that very Eastern Slavic um, accent. But, uh, but the Polish, a Polish English, English as a second language speaker was really throwing me off, so that would make sense. Um, so anyways, all signs are pointing to scam alert. Now fortunately they haven't asked me for like my social security or anything like that, so it's not terribly likely that they can do too much funny stuff with my, just my name, right? Just my first and my last name. Yeah, I suppose it's possible, but, um, you know, knock on wood. So I actually, I, uh, the guy, one of the quote unquote employees from the company, uh, emailed me recently. God, this splinter has been driving me crazy, this little cactus splinter. Little bastard. to dig it out a little bit later today. So the guy emailed me today, oh, blah, 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 we want to, you know, do stuff with you and train you and pay you, etc., etc. So I told him, uh, can you send me a copy of your driver's license, buddy? <laughs> and I, I don't think he's going to respond, but uh, I thought, you know, hey, if he's, let's see, let's see how far this, uh, you know, these guys want to go in their, um, in their scam efforts. So I haven't really decided how to proceed as far as the authorities. I kind of want to wait for at least one or, I mean, I, I'm pretty like 99.9% .9 sure they're a bunch of fraudsters at the moment, but um, it would be nice to get a little more confirmation from, uh, you know, from a couple more companies. For example, they're, they were going out of their way to choose real people. So they, they said this one guy like Mark Massetti or something from some British company, uh, I don't know, energy, something energy something or other and uh i went to the website he's actually like the founder of the company real guy so they're so they're finding these real people in these companies and then they're sort of making up these um making up these references now so i'm contacting the these alleged partners of this essex leasing company not just to confirm whether or not they're real but i want to get I want to get these partners to get on Essex Leasing as to, hey, why are you claiming that we're your partner when you're not? So, so it's not just me trying to fight them, it's all these other companies that probably have a greater interest in their reputation and are probably going to be somewhat surprised to learn that, um, to learn that they're being affiliated with this company out of nowhere, right? So that's kind of the dual purpose. Um, the dual purpose reasoning behind contacting these partners, not just for my sake, but for their sake. And then if we can get, you know, half a dozen of us contacting this company and be like, hey, what the hell is going on? Maybe they'll think twice about trying to screw over an American, at least this American. I've, uh, my bullshit meter is fairly well tuned after years and years of living in this country and dealing with morons from the left and morons from the right. So, very interesting times indeed. Very interesting times. <sighs> I was watching uh, Justin Time Prepping's uh, live stream today. He does a lot of live streams. He has a lot of people that interact with his channel. So if you are not subscribed to Justin Time Prepping, stop what you're doing, pause the video, and go over there and give him a look. He's a cool guy. He's super, um, he, his community interaction, I would give him like an 11 out of 10. Um, he, he's even like, bless his heart, you know, every time I'm on his live stream, he gives me a shout out and you know, he doesn't have to do that. My, as much as I type, I'm sort of, you know, promoting myself already, which isn't really the plan. I, you know, not too worried about more subs or less subs or whatever. I just like to really interact on a channel. But uh, he always says like, oh, hey, check out Ellie Prepper. And like, he gave me a really good shout out today, like for a few moments. And I was like, wow, that's really, you know, it's just kind of really cool, I think. Um, 
it, it's so cool because the community, you know, for the most part, I find tries to. Oh, we're gonna get we're gonna get this. Oh, there we go. The community tries to support the community, you know, in a lot of different ways, and that's of course the whole purpose of a community is that you do try to support one another. Um, that's that's kind of like what I think is the better form of communism, like so to speak. Not anything where you're forced to share by an external entity, like in communism, you know, the government kind of says, okay, you're all going to work for this, you're all going to produce this. It's a very autocratic method, but sort of a volunteer community where if, you know, if you're having trouble, maybe your neighbor helps you, and maybe if your neighbor's having trouble, you can help them. Um, I think it's a lot better when it's, uh, you know, volunteer volunteer communism, so to speak, right? Wow, and I have poured way too much paint here, but that's okay. Now, what have I done? I think I've painted myself, let's see here, we got that edge and that edge, so what we need to do, oh, this is gonna be tricky. Oh, I'm gonna get my, uh, wait, which Ninja Turtle was it? It was Donatello? Leonardo had the swords, Raphael had the size, Michelangelo had the nunchucks, yeah, Donatello had the uh, bow. Can't mix up your Ninja Turtles. It's very important. I have not, speaking of Ninja Turtles, I haven't watched the, uh, new, the new one. Maybe I should try to find it at Redbox or something since I canceled my Netflix, but it, it looked kind of awful. The original Ninja Turtles, the old, old ones, I thought were like, I don't know, they're just kind of a fun movie. Like, back when I was a kid, movies were a lot more fun, you know, like Indiana Jones and stuff like that, and it was all more about adventure and practical effects and storytelling and trying to find a good actor or two here or there. Um, even if they were no-name actors, it wasn't always about getting the most popular actor. It was just about getting actors that were quality. Like, if you go back to the 80s, you sort of find all these actors that sort of vanished into nowhere. You're like, wow, where did this guy go? Where did that guy go? And some of them sort of pop up later. Every once in a while, you'll see someone in a current show and you'll look them up and be like, oh, wow, they were in this, they were in that. No kidding. But, um, but yeah, I feel like the quality of TV has just kind of plummeted in recent years. It's all, in fact, speaking of TV, I saw... I saw a mom with her kid in the 99 cent store and her kid was just like neck down staring at the phone and I was so close to saying something to her but you know what the hell is that going to do? I guess I would have said something like do you really want to train your kid at three years old you know to be staring at your phone like if you work full time if you have a busy life maybe if you're a stay at home mom you, you know you don't care about spending quality time with your kid but I would want to spend every single minute I was with my child being with my child. Why on earth would you think that a cell phone is going to offer your child more value than what you could? Like you're at the store. Teach your kid about shopping. Teach them about prices. Have them reading the boxes. Have them, you know, try to remember like where stuff is. Like, oh, do you remember where the jello is? Do you remember where the, you know, where the whatever is, the cereal? What kind of cereal do you want? Stuff like that. To just put your kid on autopilot, I just, I think it's a really disgusting thing. Like, it's so unattractive to me to see parents do that with their kids. It just makes me want to, like, yell at them. What the hell is wrong with you? You have a human being here, and you're raising them on this electronic garbage, you know? And I don't know if you ever watch kid shows, but, like, they're the dumbest thing on the planet. What was I, I was at a client's house a while ago watching, um... Or it was on the TV, I wasn't really watching it, but it was uh, Aquanauts, I think. And, oh my god. Like, just a really, really stupid, stupid show. I mean, granted, you know, you're not expecting the most intellectual stuff when you're talking about a kid's show. But when you compare, like, Sesame Street to Aquanauts, you know, Sesame Street was a show for kids... But they didn't talk to you like you were had mental problems, you know? They talked to you like you were a young adult, kind of learning how to be an adult. But a lot of these kids' shows, it's like they're, they're not 
you know, they're not going out of their way to sort of increase the intelligence of the kid, I don't think. You know, they might have, oh, they might have one or two, you know, educational facts about this is an octopus or something stupid like that, but I, I generally find them to be completely devoid of anything remotely valuable for your child. So my two cents is if your kids like watching garbage on TV, you got you got to cut that off now. You know, get them a bow and arrow, get them a couple Nerf guns, get them out in the garden, get them doing anything but watching TV. I don't care if they're just like hammering nails into a piece of board for no reason, but they're basically not going to be learning anything remotely useful from TV. At least that's you know that's my opinion. Um, I do not plan on, I mean, would I let my kids watch TV now and then? Yeah, sure, but would I let them, you know, spend all weekend parked in front of the boob tube? No, not, not a chance. There's too much work to be done. Too much, uh, too much work in the garden, gotta tend the chickens, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's, I plan on having a volunteer army of children. I'll have five kids and I'll just have them all working in the field. <laughs> That's the way they used to do it in America, you know? You didn't have time to sit around and watch TV and play video games. You had work to do. In the, in the country, kids would wake up at, you know, 4 or 5 o'clock, work the farm for a few hours, walk to school if they were lucky enough to have a school near them, maybe take the bus if they had a bus or something, but... Then you come home, maybe do a little bit of homework, or maybe work on the farm a little more, do a little homework, and... Uh, do your chores, and by the time you went to bed, you were exhausted. You didn't have time to argue and fight and bicker as much as you might think. Um, you know, you you were you worked because you had to work, because you wanted to eat. You didn't raise chickens for the fun of it. You raised chickens because maybe you couldn't afford to buy eggs at the store. And nowadays, people would rather buy eggs at the store even if they could raise chickens. You know, so it's just crazy to me how we've gone from you know, living in a, in a way where we can kind of support ourselves in a, in a very large way, if not completely, to being 100% dependent on going to work, sitting in a box, you know, doing what you're told, probably not having a terribly exciting work existence. And for most people, the expenses of living in an apartment or living in a house and all the utilities and all the insurance and the cable bill and the cell phone bill and the gas bill and the water bill and the trash bill and the da 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 you know, you just, you can't, you can't get ahead. Or at least a lot of people can't get ahead. You know, maybe if you're, you know, you got some dual income you make you're pulling the households pulling in 120,000 plus a year you can get ahead but um, like my folks both worked my entire uh, basically my entire upbringing my mom I you know she kind of started like doing different jobs and tutoring and stuff she was at home when we were younger like four five six and stuff like that but once we started getting older I mean I remember walking home and riding my bike home, um, like in the fifth grade, you know, when, how old are you in the fifth grade? Let's see, 12th grade, you're 18, so like six, so like 11 years old, you know, 10, 11 years old. So by the time, I think my sister was about 10 or 11, my mom was pretty much doing tutoring stuff, and then she got her teaching credential and kind of went into that. And, uh, you know, we, um, they they worked their butts off. My poor dad worked as a consultant for years and years and years. He's a civil engineer, in case you're wondering where I get my engineeringness from. Although he certainly never taught me calculus, that would have been useful, right? But <laughs> but uh, in fact, I remember I was having trouble with like Matt, like years and years ago in high school, I was having trouble with Matt, and I was just like breaking down in my room, and he just kind of came in and laughed at me, like, "What's wrong with you?" I was like, "Wow, thanks, Dad." <laughs> Real motivational, right? But, uh, oh no, we're spilling paint all over the place. But uh, yeah, they both worked uh, pretty much from when my sister and I were like past, uh, past like nine or ten. 
paid off their uh, 30 year mortgage early. Now, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about that, to be honest. I'm not sure what their interest rate was. Granted, paying the interest early, um, you avoid paying a lot of interest, but of course, there's the opportunity cost of taking that money and investing into the market. So, who knows if. I don't think it was the worst idea in the world, especially given the volatility of the market. But, uh, and then go figure, they end up buying their next house cash, so they're avoiding any interest, but you know, all their monies are in the stock market, so cross your fingers that the whole economy doesn't turn into a uh, mush because, uh, yeah, I mean, I have to admit, if the stock market did go to crap, you know, my parents own their house right now free and clear, but they definitely would be hurting for retirement if the stock market evaporated, you know. If it took, if it crashed and then it took another 10 years to come back, um, I mean, I think they have some savings and such and they have bonds and some things that aren't really connect in the market, aren't as volatile, but there's more than one reason that I desire to, um, there's more than one reason that I desire to make some amount of money and have some amount of security in my future. And it's not, it's not just for me. It's not just for me and my, you know, and my wife and kids and stuff like that. It's for, it's for my family. It's for my friends. Um, you know, relatives. Uh, if I ever had an aunt or an uncle or cousins that, you know, were, were having trouble with cash or they had to sell their house and they couldn't afford it or whatever, to be able to have some land and say, look, come, you know, come live with me as long as you want, never have to pay rent, you know, not even going to have you, you know, force you to do chores or whatever. You're my family. You've been there for me. And, uh, and even maybe if they really hadn't been there for me, if they're still my family, like for example, my cousins, you know, I don't really, my cousins on like my mom's sister from my mom's sister, um, you know, they kind of helped me out and I hung out with them a little bit here and there, but we're not like super, super close. I would still let them move with their family back, you know, to my house and live on my land as long as they want, you know, get them an RV for a few thousand bucks and it's not going to be the most glamorous life, but they're not going to have a landlord breathing down their neck. So there's a lot of different reasons that I want land to homestead. And it's not just because I want to raise chickens. It's because I want to, I want to increase the security, the long-term security of everyone that I know. You know, my family, my friends, extended family. Um, I, I don't think there's really a good reason in this day and age that people should sort of be completely focused on their own, their own success, their own, well, if I'm, you know, if I have money, but my sister's broke, then that sucks for her or something like that. You know, I don't, I don't believe in that. Now, granted, most of my family doesn't really need help, of course, you know, there are different levels of wealth, and that's kind of how it is in many families. Um, and not everyone in my family is kind of as crazy driven as I am. Um, some of them are living sort of more quiet lives, some of them have not necessarily advanced professionally or otherwise in the last few years, and you know, that's okay, it's not really for me to judge, but it does kind of make me think, you know, if you spent the last 10 years and you haven't really gotten more than a couple meaningful promotions and you're still kind of renting, you might not be thinking about buying a house. Um, you know, you got to kind of think like, where am I going to be in the next five years? Where am I going to be in the next 10 years? Do I want to rent forever? I don't think renting forever is really a great idea, at least personally. Some, some people do. I met a tax guy who who said he rents his house now and he all but he also owns like god this guy owned like a like a hundred rental properties or some stupid amount of rental properties now he didn't have to work did not have to work but he worked every single day and i gotta tell you he gave a speech on taxes and it was one of the most interesting speeches i've ever heard and i told him after the fact i said you know I'm not like super interested in taxes, but that was a really interesting presentation. Like I really learned a lot, thank you. And uh, he was like, oh, you know, thanks, whatever, he was a cool guy. And he was telling me like, oh yeah, I don't, uh, I don't own, I rent. And I was like, wow, that's really, really interesting. And I, I figured it must have been because, you know, because he's a tax guy, so either he didn't want 
the liability or he had some kind of tax thing going on where like it was owned by a business or, you know I don't, I don't know exactly like what his deal was or he didn't want I don't really know but um, but I just thought it was like really really interesting I've met I've met several interesting people in real estate one of the most well probably the most interesting person I ever met in real estate was uh, his name was Sean O'Toole he's the founder of foreclosure radar which is a company that aggregated a lot of data on uh, distressed homes. Uh, but he founded it back in 2008-2009. And what's really interesting about Sean O'Toole is that he used to own something like 150 rentals. He had made some money. I don't know what he did to make money, but he made some money. And he sold all of those homes before the market crashed. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy that you know, somehow he knew, somehow him and his billionaire buddies, one of his buddies or something, just gave him a call and said, hey, uh, you should sell all your homes. We're overpriced, we're in a bubble, and uh, you're going to regret holding on to it. And I swear, like, I wonder, you know, if somebody gave you advice that it was that good and ended up saving you tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, at least tens of millions of dollars, man, I'd want to buy him like a boat or a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something. I'd buy him something for sure. So then... So he sells all his homes, and then he starts Foreclosure Radar, and uh, yeah, he was just like at a conference sometime, and I met him. I told him that uh, I told him his software helped me pay for my Lexus, which is true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, craziness, crazy real estate stuff. Another super interesting guy I met um, in at an investment meeting, kind of a small meetup. I don't know if they ever ended up getting off the ground, but. It was a guy who flipped farmland, cash. So what he would do is, uh, oh, and I have my hammer, ha ha ha. He's looking for you, little bastard. Oh, gotta fix this guy too, the head's a little bit loose, shame on me. But uh, so this guy flipped um, farm equipment. Let me wash this, uh, rinse the brush real quick. Maybe I'll switch over to the brush rinsing station. Not flipped farm equipment, flipped farms. And, uh, so he was telling me about it. Now, the interesting thing about, oh God, my sink is a disaster. I don't usually let my kitchen get to this freaking awful state of ridiculousness, but so the guy flipped um, guy flipped farmland now farm because it's a business is considered an investment so oh, let's see what am I oh the angle on here I want to there we go not have this turn into an upside down video so a farm is an investment it means that if you have you know a farm producing a certain amount of stuff, you know, let's say your farm produces $100,000 a year, then you do your net present value. And if you don't know what net present value is, just go ahead and look it up. It's the idea that the value of a property is relative to the income that you're gonna collect over the life of the property discounted by a certain amount, okay? Not a big deal. So the bottom line is the more income you have, the more the property is worth. Now the funny thing about income is that it doesn't necessarily have to be income you've realized, it's sort of income potential, right? So what this guy did was he would, he would buy some farmland that wasn't really doing well. Maybe the, you know, the dirt wasn't, oh, that's right, I don't have the goddamn, ugh, the water's off right now, crap. God, that's frustrating. Oh, that is frustrating. Well, I guess I can put it in the fridge, but yeah, maybe I'll put it on the fridge and then I'll use it for some white paint later. So, uh, where was I? Um, yeah, flipping farmland. 
So he would buy a farm cash that wasn't really producing well, and typically the farm would only have one crop on it. You know, I don't know, almonds or tomatoes or whatever. And so what he would do is he would increase the amount of crops by one or two fold, or like two or three. So if it just had one crop, he would add a second crop and or maybe a third crop. Now, not only did this increase the income of the property, but it also affected the health of the soil. So let's say you had a plant that wanted a lot of nitrogen, you would sort of try to work with another plant that maybe did not want a lot of nitrogen. Or if you had a plant that wanted a lot of phosphorus, you would plant another plant near it that maybe gave off, gave off phosphorus or didn't need a lot of phosphorus. So he tried to kind of find plants that had a symbiotic nature. You know, so there'd be like a tree, maybe you had a bunch of trees, and then he would plant like some tomatoes next to them, and then maybe potatoes under the tomatoes or something like that. So what he did was he effectively changed the, val changed the income potential of the farm from just having one income stream to three income streams. And because, and even if, you know, he hadn't had like a crop harvest or something like that, an appraiser can go and say, oh, and yes, you know, they have like appraisers that specialize in farms and such. Appraiser could go look at it and say, okay, previously it had just the one crop, but now it has three crops, which means not, not that you're going to have three times as much income, but you might have 20 or 30% or 40% or whatever more income. And because you have more income, the entire farm as a business is valued higher. So the guy would come in, buy the farm, kind of flip it, so to speak, rehab the land, plant a couple more crops, and in a matter of like less than a year or so, he would have a farm that might be worth 20, 30, 40% more. Then he would sell that farm, take the cash, rinse and repeat. And it was just one of the most interesting ways to make money that I'd ever heard of. And I sort of joked with him and I said, you know, why don't you, uh, why don't you leverage your money? You know, you could buy an even bigger farm if you kind of leverage yourself a little bit. And he just kind of smiled the way that people smile when they realize that they have way more experience than you. And he just, he just said, I like cash. <laughs> and ever since then, you know, not ever since then, but that was a very interesting, um, experience in my, in my real estate career. Uh, it kind of got me thinking more about farming, got me thinking about flipping, got me thinking about, you know, sweat equity. Um, tell you, the interesting people you meet in real estate, just fascinating, fascinating people. And one thing that I really always enjoyed about talking with real estate investors specifically, they're never shy about telling you what they do to make money. There's, there's not this sense that like, oh, you're going to steal my idea or something because... The bottom line is most people just don't have the desire, energy, or the risk tolerance to do what the go-getters do. Like my old boss and I used to knock on doors of people that, you know, were having trouble with their homes. And yeah, you might feel one way or the other about it. But bottom line was after they were done talking with us, they, you know, they had the option of working with a team of professionals, us, that would give them a little bit more control over their situation, whether it was a void foreclosure through a short sale, a deed in lieu, or even just trying to work with the bank and, you know, deal with the trustee and just kind of give them more time or whatever. Because a lot of homeowners sort of became like a turtle in the shell when the whole foreclosure thing hit. They would, um, they would kind of freak out and not call the bank and not, you know, answer the door, not talk to anyone and just kind of just in complete denial that they were going to about they were about to uh you know lose their properties and it was kind of a really really sad thing to see um to see you know grown men and women all these adults and families and no not all of them had sub subprime loans not all of them were buying boats and yachts and things like that um a good portion of them uh it was kind of simple they just had an adjustable rate loan even if it wasn't a terrible loan and they had some issues with their income the loan adjusted, they didn't have the money, and uh, because the market went down, they were upside down. So normally when people lose a job but they have a house, they sell the house and they downsize, they live in an apartment, whatever, everyone's fine. 
But when everyone's trying to sell your house and you owe more than the house is worth, which is a short sale, uh, you're not doing good. You're doing very poorly, in fact. So, no, I uh, I talked to over several hundred people that were in this situation, and I tell you, it gave me a different perspective on life. Um, you know, taught me that life is precious, that you have to save your money, you have to work hard, um, and that you know the unexpected can really happen to. Uh, can really happen to anyone you know no one is immune from life getting crazy um, you know medical bills loss of job change in income um, and uh, definitely taught me about the value of fixed interest you will never ever ever see me on an adjustable rate loan never in a million years will you see me ever touch an adjustable rate mortgage there's just no way. Um, the only time I can maybe, maybe think that I would ever do that is if it was like bridge financing or something. Like if I had an adjustable rate mortgage and I was going to flip a house and the rate adjusted in five years, but I planned on selling the house in a year. Maybe in a situation like that where I knew or at least I had a strong reason to believe that I wasn't going to be on the loan in five years. And even then I would definitely refinance um, before that. But I don't, uh, I'm not personally a big fan of adjustable rate mortgages because the problem was people were buying homes they could kind of barely afford. And the lenders being the scumbags, you know, that they were, were just giving out money hand over fist like it was going out of style. Um, and you couldn't. You know, people were just, you know, you show them a W-2 or something, get a little bit of income, and people were getting approved for all sorts of insane loans. Some people were probably approved for the loans they were getting, but the thing is, people were getting approved for loans that they just barely qualified for, and they didn't have any room for, you know, for adjustment. They didn't have any room to lose income. They didn't have any room for nothing, so they were... They were just putting themselves like on the precipice, on the edge of a cliff, so that if any one individual thing happened, they were going to lose the property. And lo and behold, a lot of things happened. The market went to crap. The loans adjusted. They lost some income, family emergency, medical bill not covered by insurance, car breaks down, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it was... Uh, you got to keep in mind, a lot of these people were, uh, you know, asset rich, but cash poor. So you take all your money that you have saved up, theoretically, not all your money, but a lot of people was a lot of their money, majority of their savings. They buy the house. They're living month to month. They have basically no savings left. So when the emergency came, when the loans reset, when the market went to crap, they couldn't refinance. They couldn't sell the house. They couldn't make the mortgage payment and you know, in a matter of 90 days, 120 days, they were in foreclosure and getting letters from the trustee. And it was a really crappy situation, but, and there were a lot of different people at fault, but uh, completely preventable, you know, get a fixed rate loan, keep your job. And uh, God forbid you ever have trouble with the job or something. At least you could have tried to stay in the home or whatever. But the problem was so many people bought when the market was so high they just, they didn't think that it was worth it to keep the property because they figured, well, you know, if they bought it for five, if they owed like 600000 but the market said it was worth four hundred and fifty, they knew even if they weren't real estate experts, it was going to be, I don't know, you know, five years before the market came back. So are you going to pay for something that's worth less than zero dollars? You know, are you going to pay it for a worthless asset for the next five years of your life just so you don't lose it? Nope, and they didn't, and we had the housing crisis, and it was a, it was a goddamn disaster. Anyways, not to get too sideways on a real estate rant, but wow, it's so dry. All of this is already dry. That's crazy. So what I'll probably do is give it just a little bit more love with some sandpaper. The uh, the paint tends to kind of make all the little fuzzies a little bit rough. Let's see here. Looking at my beautiful paddle there. Yeah, wow. In the time that I was talking, all this paint dried. That's crazy. 
or pretty dry anyways. Maybe not dry enough to sand right now, but very, very dry. So I'll probably give this another hour or so, maybe a couple hours just to make sure it's a little harder. Sand it down, we'll throw a couple top coats on it. And uh, oh, we'll see about trying to work on the frame maybe tomorrow morning. Yeah. Well, until next time, YouTube. Thanks for hanging around while I uh, painted and uh, talked about well, all sorts of different things, as is my habit. Keep working on those projects. Let me know how those projects are going. I'd love to see them. I'd love to see videos of them. If you need help on a project, um, go ahead and post it. And if I can't help you, I'll make sure to try to get someone in the community that has more experience than I do help you. And uh, like, comment, subscribe, and keep prepping.